week I gave, began to look at and, and just sort of what may be the most foundational teachings for believers. Um, I'm not talking about non-believers, but for believers. And that is to look at um, the two commandments that God says are the greatest of all. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, I shared that I had talk, was going to talk about some other things, like does, does God care about our desires, what we want, and all. And I just, like there was this block, and I realized the cart was before the horse. And what, what you've got to focus on as Christians are those two greatest commandments. And then everything else will start to flow from those. And I know that from personal experience and biblically, um, so we talked about you know how Jesus is that cornerstone. All of life begins with him as the cornerstone upon which the whole foundation of our life is built. And for those who reject Jesus, then he becomes the stumbling block, as the Bible says. But basically, when we stand before God, all of eternity is going to be defined by what do we do with his son, Jesus. Do we embrace him in faith and build our life upon that? Do we reject him as the Messiah and the Christ? You know, just simply a good teacher, a historical figure, or whatever. Um, and then, from that, of his teachings, though, if they become the foundation, and if we think about that, in that parable where Jesus says, you know, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? And he says, here's, here's what the person's like who hears my words and obeys them, and hears like the, what the person's like who hears my words and doesn't. And he said they both build a house through their life, both have storms that rise against the house. The only difference is the one is built on the rock and one is built on the sand. One has the foundation of the house that stands, is, the, is hearing God's words and living them living that out, building our life upon his teachings, upon his, what he reveals about God. And the other hears those same things, but doesn't, just dismisses them. And that's the house that will stand, that's the life that will collapse. And when he talks about that, and again, the only difference is the foundation. He equates the foundation to, you heard my words, now what have you done with them? That's the foundation in that parable that Jesus talks about. And then we went on to talk about how Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. All the commandments and everything as he loved the Father perfectly and loved those around him. Everything, all the other commandments that can just weigh us down and burden us and these lists of ought to's and not to's and the guilt and the condemnation and I'm this failure and I'm constantly falling short. We focus on love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love our neighbors, ourself, and most of those others will just start to take care of themselves. I'm not going to do that, not because I'm not supposed to. I don't want to. I love God. I don't want to do that. You know, or as I love my neighbor, I'm not going to lie to them. I'm not going to steal from them. I'm not going to neglect them when they're in need. I'm not going to tempt them. I'm not going to. It's love is the foundation of all of God's commands. And then Jesus just goes in and he just starts to say, the law, you know, you want to walk by a list of do's and don'ts, you know, okay, well, here's the heart of the Father, you know, it's not just about murder, it's about anger in your heart, it's not just about adultery, it's about lust in your heart, you know, if you really want to try and perform for God, and earn your way to God, here's actually the true standard, and then he just talks about love, and talks about fulfilling it, and, and I really believe, just strongly, that if we approach all of God's ought to's and not to's on our own strength, I, I'm, I ought to live this way, I'm not supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do this, and all that, I know in personal experience, I just burn out. Uh, I try. You know, I, I, I've told you guys so many times, I remember one time, my younger days pastoring, um, Mary and I had been counseling with a couple over in Lockwood and their marriage was really struggling and felt like God used whatever and coming back and I still, I, I still remember, I'm driving over the top of Bryce of the Sperry, that the spot right at the top, we look down into Lockwood and I'm like, man, I'm glad that I'm not like that. I hadn't 
hadn't been home 20 minutes. And I remember I'm in the screen porch and I jumped on Marianne for some stupid thing and God just put the mirror. And it was like, oh, I can't do it. You know, you go to your men's retreats and you come back, I'm going to be a better husband and a better father and a better... And, and if it's on your own strength and effort, we can't do it. We can't say no to temptation. We can't do anything on our own strength and effort. But God allowed to fully occupy us, our lives, loving Him and loving those around us, putting up nothing to quench or grieve the Holy Spirit, God's presence in us. That stuff's going to start to just take care of itself. And we talked about that circle, and I'm going to come back to that to this week and probably next. There's this circle. Okay, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, one of them is love, self-control, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, you know, all these, right? They're fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces that in us. Well, when we love, we don't quench or grieve the Holy Spirit. We fulfill the heart of God. And so the Holy Spirit starts to produce in us more love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, which means we start to love more and the Holy Spirit's even more excited and able to move more freely and just like, it's wonderful. Likewise, when we fail to love God, we fail to love others, we start to quench and grieve the Holy Spirit, which means we produce a little less love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and then which means we quench and grieve a little more, so we produce a little less. And the next thing you know, I mean, none of us in this room would start off, I don't think, saying, I want to end up a long way away from God and I'm going to commit these heinous things and do all this stuff. But none of us. We wouldn't even be here today if we just had, that was our heart. But how many of us have ended up there? How many of us have one day woken up in this place and go, how did I get here? How did God feel so distant? How did my life seem so messed up? Those tiny little steps. Those tiny little steps. I remember in the army, we do land navigation. I was a scout, so that was big on us. You know, and they, they'd always say, you know, when you go and pick a spot, shoot your azimuth and pick a spot the farthest distance you can and, and mark that you can see. Mark that mountain, that tree, that whatever, and walk towards that. If you don't want to do this with the compass the whole time, which you don't if there's bad guys out there. You know, so you just, you go towards that. They said, because if you don't fix on a point, you won't notice it. But by tiny degrees, you're going to head in a, a circle. And eventually, you return. And one time we did it with the youth. I was trying to explain it. And so I started, I think I remember how I did I started two kids back at that door, I want to say. And I had one just aim right here, or something like a pulpit or something. And I had the other, I set them off like one degree or something like that. I, do you guys remember exactly how I did something like that? At the same, and by this distance, one was at the piano and one was right here. I mean, and they were kind of like, whoa. And for that, that's, that, that's the difference. Just a tiny degree, just off. And where we go, and... And so we, ju we just talked about this last week, and I, I want to recap this like I'm doing because I'm going to just continue to build on this. It's, it's, it's critical. We, we're here because we want to be closer to God. We're here because we want to be closer to each other as a family like God's called us to be. We're here because we want this community and this region to know Him. And God's put us here and trusted it. We're surrounded with broken marriages, broken homes, suicidal spirits, addictions, all of this, it, the devil runs amok with chains. He cripples us. And he cripples those around us. And we want to see those chains broken. We want to see victory that God promised. That he died for on the cross. We want to see the demonic kicked out. We want to see healings. And this is the foundation to it all. Love just says, Holy Spirit, come and move. And lacking of love, quench, grieve. And yeah, the Spirit's still in us. We're still saved. But we've so quenched it, Him that we just, we can't. And, and, you know, as the example I used last week, it's like that teeter-totter or seesaw, whatever you call it. You know, you have the Spirit on one side and the flesh on the other. 
And, and there's no middle ground. There's no vacuums in nature. As the flesh rises as ruling in our life, the spirit will drop. And as the spirit rises and ruling in our life, the flesh's power over us will drop. There's no neutral ground. And I remember my history professor in high school, he, he, he was an amazing teaching about world and current events, and I had him for AP US and AP European history, and just this incredible teacher, he would always say, you know, he talked about Switzerland or whatever, and he always go, there is no such thing as neutrality. Because being neutral, you are simply supporting the stronger side. And it was like, whoa. Okay. But, but that's very true in our spiritual life, too. There's no middle ground. Either we're feeding the spirit or we're feeding the flesh. We're either walking according to the spirit or walking according to the flesh. And so we, we talked about that. And then um, talked about near the end last week that I believe there's a reason for the order of those two commandments. You know, and I've already alluded to it that talked about directly this morning, actually. If I start out to love my neighbor on my own strength, I'm going to find that difficult, if not impossible. And I'll, I'll touch on that again in a minute. But if I focus on loving him, that becomes a lot easier. And again, I'll return to that in a minute. But I, when I feel like God's doing something, I start to get excited. Um, and, and God's doing something in us, okay? There's something, like I told you, that wasn't my plan to teach last Sunday. I had a different topic, but it wasn't right. It wasn't right. And finally that Saturday and that early Sunday morning, it broke through, and that's what I was supposed to teach about the heart of God. And if we're not in alignment with those two things, the rest just doesn't work. I mean, we'll grit our teeth and do our church stuff, but... It's not going to be blessed. It's not going to flow. And then there was all these confirmations that came through the week. Um, I was supposed to have taught Mark 7 at men's group like three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. And it turned out no one could make it. It was just Rod and I and Marianne and I had to go to Monterey for a VA appointment the next day anyway. So we just hung out with Ron and Debbie for a few minutes and took off. So last Wednesday, I taught Mark 7. Well, what is Mark 7? The first half of it is Jesus rebuking the Pharisees. The ones that you would have thought he would have, you know, the keepers of the temple, the church people, right? And he's rebukes them because their heart is so off from the heart of God. They've got all the religious form, right? But they don't have the heart of the Father. They don't have those things, the weightier matters. Nowhere does Jesus ever say to neglect the ought to's and not to's. But he said there's, there's something bigger in that, the heart of the Father. It's about love, mercy, kindness, gentleness, these things. And so we read that whole first half of Mark, which is about that, and then we roll into the Syrophoenician woman. And this is it's stunning. And for you guys who are at men's group, sorry, you're getting a recap here. But... This woman, a Gentile, saw in Jesus something that the religious leaders of Israel didn't even see. And she comes to him because her daughter is demonized, hence her daughter is sick. It's, there's more major issues in her daughter because of demonization. And she's like, Lord, heal my daughter, please cast out this. And Jesus says these words that if we're not careful, we're going to go, whoa, this guy is a jerk. And she, he basically says... I've come for the children of Israel. It's not right that one would give the children's bread to the dogs. And, you know, you know, she just called her a dog. No, he's giving an analogy. Jesus came to Israel, to the Jews first, and God, there was a hardening of a heart, rejected it, opened his work to the entire world, to the Gentiles. And that's where Paul says, don't get arrogant towards the Jews. You're in because he hardened their heart that you've been grafted into their tree and he is bringing them back. You know, he's like, be careful. And, um, but 
Jesus kind of looks at her. I think he's looking. I think he already knows her heart, but I, I almost see his little grin on his face there that I could be wrong. But he's kind of like, all right. You know, and he says, this thing, would it be right? Basically, I'm paraphrasing, but would it be right if there were hungry children for the father to take the bread off the table and feed it to the dog? No, I wouldn't be right at all. And then she says these words. She goes, yes, but even the dogs are satisfied or happy with the crumbs that fall from the table. She's like, even with the crumbs of what you brought to Israel, my daughter would be healed. That's faith. And he's like, woman, your faith. Go home, your daughter's fine. And I think of that, I think of the centurion who wasn't a Jew. And Jesus goes, nowhere in Israel have I found such faith. I think of, you know, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. And you know, you think of these people that the religious leaders were so blinded in their religion that they missed the heart of God in front of them. And yet the others that weren't could see in this Jesus, this is, there's something this man. And the faith that they exhibited. And so this contrast in Mark 7 was just so powerful. You have this one that has done probably nothing religiously meritorious to earn any praise from God, but simply has this simple faith. And God just like, oh, my daughter's healed. And you have the ones who've done all the religious checklists, but have this heart that's cold and everything else and miss the heart of God. And he's like, rebukes them. And it's like, wow. Wow. What a contrast in there. And, and a very interesting thing I point out to the men, something I had not seen recently. This is, I am now heading off on a rabbit trail. I will try and remember to come back. But this is important. What was she asking for? Healing and deliverance, right? What did he say? It's the bread of the children. He didn't deny that was for, he just said that's for the children. Who are we? Children. That's our bread. We have every right to contend for healing and deliverance in our ministries. And by ministry, I don't mean title ministry. I mean your life, people in your life. That's your ministry. That's our right. That is our birthright as his children. As Jesus came, that word sozo in the Greek, I'm really far down the trail now, but that word sozo in the Greek is translated healing, deliverance. We, we mostly see it as salvation, but it is also translated healing and deliverance in the New Testament. Those are all encompassed. There's a wholeness to what Jesus came. I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. I have come to bring this to the children. And who are the children? Anyone who believes in faith. And so, that was the first confirmation. Then I get a blog post from Randy Alcorn, and if you may have seen this, I shared it on Facebook. But he said, I gotta share this. It's, I love this thing that Eugene Peterson um, puts in his book, The Jesus Way. This is how to know you've become a Pharisee. I'm like, okay, Lord, you are doing something here. <laughs> but here's, I'll read it to you. Imagine yourself moving into a house with a huge picture window overlooking a grand view across a wise expanse of water enclosed by a range of snow-capped mountains. You have a ringside seat before wild storms and cloud formations, the entire spectrum of sun-illuminated colors in the rocks and trees and wildflowers and water. I thought of you, Del, and Colleen. Yeah. Sounds like a cabin we'd love to hang out in. <laughs> You're captivated by the view. Several times a day you interrupt your work and stand before this window to take in the majesty and the beauty, thrilled with the botanical and meteorological fireworks. One afternoon you notice some bird droppings on the window glass, get a bucket of water and a towel and you clean it. A couple of days later a rainstorm leaves the window streaked and the bucket comes out again. Another day visitors come with a thrive of small dirty fingered children. The moment they leave, you see all the smudge marks on the glass and they're hardly out the door before you have the bucket out. You are so proud of that window and it's such a large window, but it's incredible how many different ways foreign objects can attach themselves to that window, obscuring the vision, distracting from the contemplative beauty. Keeping that window clean develops into an obsessive compulsive neurosis. You accumulate ladders and buckets and squeegees. You construct a scaffolding inside and out to make it possible to get to all the difficult corners and heights. 
You have the cleanest window in North America, but it's now been years since you looked through it. You have become a Pharisee. And what I think he's saying there is we can get so caught up in our religious stuff that we forget to just be in awe of God, to just worship Him and contemplate His beauty, His love, His majesty, His holiness, His power, His goodness, His grace, His mercy, to just be still and stare out the window of the eyes of our heart and worship just look at God and be in awe. Because we get so caught up. And, and this is where we have to be careful because this then here comes the, well, I don't need to go to church because I can worship God on the golf course. Okay? It, no, that's not biblical. God says do not neglect the gathering together of the saints, especially as the times draw near. Okay? We are meant to encourage one another, to build up one another, to share our resources, to bear one another's burdens to stand, to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice, to walk through life as family. That is biblical. And if you look at the early church, they gathered together, yes, in homes. They also gathered together corporately in synagogues, in temples. So we see this pattern. This is not saying all church is bad. God says to give your first fruits to the church. He says to study his word, that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work, Okay. This is Bible studies, men's groups, women's groups, youth groups, tithes and offerings and Sunday mornings are good. What gets bad is when they replace the object that it's all about, which is Jesus, which is the Father, which is God. When we get so religious and we one day wake up dry in our spirit and go, how? Oh, I'm doing church stuff six times a week. How am I so distant from God and dry? It's we've stopped worshiping Him. We've stopped just being still and just worshiping Him. And being in awe of Him. And then I was looking at Psalm 51, which will come up, well, I'd say later today, we're looking at the clock, maybe not, but at some point. Um, and in Psalm 51, okay, David's been convicted of his sin with Bathsheba. And he's feeling this guilt. His greatest grief is that he has sinned against God. And what would you think? You know, I better make it right somehow. But here's how the psalm ends, basically. Psalm 51, 15 to 17. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice religious work stuff, or I would give it to you. You'll not be pleased with a burnt offering, another sacrifice. The sacrifices of God, that which you seek, God, are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. He just says, are you going to come to me with your heart broken? God, I'm a mess. Here I am. You got me. I got no religious pretense to offer. I'm not trying to say I've earned any favor or merit. I just come to your mercy and your love. Here I am, a mess. Here's my life. I just, these confirmations, all through, you look at this alignment. You look at what I taught last week about God's desire for our heart to be loving of him and others. You look at, the, the Mark 7 contrast that I should have taught a long time ago at men's group. You look at Randy Alcorn's reading of Eugene Peterson's the How to Know You're a Pharisee. You look at this in, these ending verses of Psalm 51, which I was studying for another reason. It's like, all right, Lord, you're doing something here. And what excites me is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and then to love our neighbors, ourselves. That is the doorway which God just is all over. God just pours in, and he can't if those aren't in alignment. I think God wants to pour out his spirit and start to see this region change. We have been crying out for this, but these have to be aligned. We cannot be a church church. We cannot be a religious church. And I know at one time someone who was 
definitely a, a one generation older than me, kind of got on me. They said, Eric, that word religious is not bad to me. That's a compliment. Okay, so I, just to clarify, the way I'm using that is more of the context, it's sort of surfaced since maybe the Jesus movement. It's not religion, it's relationship, okay? It's, it's not about church stuff. And, you know, I've, I've shared this story many times with many of you. I think I shared it with someone last week. Um, I remember Chuck Smith, they found a Calvary Chapel, and the elders at some church were getting all upset during the Jesus movement because they just put in new carpet and new cushions on the pews, and the hippies were coming in barefoot covered in sand. And they were kind of giving them the looks and stuff. And he pulled them aside and said, if those pews and that carpet is an obstacle to us loving these people, I will tear them out myself. So you pick. What are you going to do? Love them? And have, you know, dirty pews? Or have whatever? Because I'm not going to have the clean pews with just church people. This is what we prayed for. Is that these people would come in off the drugs and come in off the street and start to love Jesus. And and, and I think God's doing something. And so what, what I what I have found though, okay, and this is something that I don't think this is just true in my life. After a teaching like I gave last week, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. My instinct, my personal experience, and just even comments I've heard is it's easier for us to focus on the second one than the first. Okay? We all have relationship issues in our life. We all have people that have hurt us. We all have people around us that are unlovable. And that's the tangible thing to grab. We're doers. I mean, if you think about it, God even put Adam in the garden and said, now go tend it. Okay? We're doers. We're fixers, especially guys. We're fixers. Okay? Um, and you, know, you hear it, you just want to fix it. And that's who we are. And so we hear that teaching, and I think because there's so many wounds in our life and, and strained relationships, we immediately gravitate towards love your, the neighbor as yourself. The Satan's there to point out how many people we don't really love the way we should and to remind us of all this and things like that. And if you think about really loving God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, that's pretty vague. Like, what does that really look like or mean? How do I do that? You know, but my neighbor, yeah, I can go bring him a meal. I can go call this person I haven't wanted to talk to, you know. It's more tangible. And in nothing I'm about to say, please do not hear me say it's not important. Okay, it's one of the two greatest commandments, and it fulfills the law. I'm not saying loving our neighbor is not important. Okay, you did not hear me say that. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, in fact. You've heard this a hundred times. Please hear it. Like Jesus said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Okay, he's talking to everyone who heard him. He's talking about here and here. If I speak, these are all gifts types of the Spirit, okay, things we crave. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith even, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver my body to be burned, if I am martyred for Christ, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Okay? So you did not hear me say loving our neighbor is not important or essential. But what you are hearing me say is that if we kind of skip past loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and soul, and mind, and body, If we put loving our neighbor over that, and I know none of us would do that intellectually, because as good Christians we know that's not right, but if our life pattern doesn't reflect the priority of loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind first, I think again we've put the cart before the horse and we've tied our hands behind our back. 
Because the Bible says if we love God, we will obey his commandments. And that's his first and greatest beyond loving him. We will love others. And he said, for if we love him, his commandments are not burdensome. I mean, let's, let's just be honest. There's a lot of people in our lives that it's seemingly impossible to love. Their personalities, their offenses, how needy they are, how much they might drain us, whatever it might be, or our own fears and selfishness or insecurity doesn't allow us to love freely, or whatever it could be. And you know, don't set aside the fact that the Bible makes it clear our real enemy is not flesh and blood, not the ones around us, but principalities and powers, it's a spiritual force that stirs up hatred and division. I have seen this, I don't know about you guys, but I have seen in Christian relationships, irritability and anger and resentment and bitterness at, at a higher level than I have seen it in a long time. And the other day I was thinking about it, and I'm thinking, you know what? I think none of us would deny that there's a spirit of hatred over this nation right now and division. Okay, I, I feel fully that first of all we've lost a spiritual covering over this nation and I feel that there is a spirit in, in things that a few years ago even we disagreed with each other about or irritated each other we now hate each other over in this nation there is hate that is running rampant and if that is truly a spiritual move of hate and division across this nation, which it sure seems to be, then we are not immune as Christians. This influence, just like if there's heaviness or things, we start to have it infiltrate. If we do not aggressively resist the devil, put on the armor of God, stand against, love the Lord God, follow our strength and mind, love our neighbors, ourselves, this will start to creep in, and we will see even in Christian relationships increasing division, resentment, bitterness, hatred, irritation, uh, all of this. And I think it's much bigger. Now, what's wrong with me or what's wrong with this relationship? I, I'm not excusing our choices in it, but I think there's a spiritual thing that I'm realizing in these last few weeks that is far bigger at work than I maybe gave it credit for. And it's something I think we do have to be careful about. And so we also have this very real spiritual enemy stirring up, quick to remind us of how offense, much offense this person's caused us, and this is and that, um, stirring them up to even act worse. You know how many times you reach out to someone and it almost seems like they come back twice as hard or something? And all this, the, the obstacles to loving our neighbor as ourself are huge. And the resistance, I mean, if God flows behind love and is all over love, then of course the enemy is going to stand against that in a mighty way. Because the last thing he wants to see is any obstacles to the Holy Spirit moving in us in a mighty way and through us across our hills and valleys to be removed. He doesn't want that. He would much rather we sit in our, our you know, comfy chairs and pews and our religious smugness and go, well, I do church every Sunday and a midweek study and I put in my tithes and everything else and then we just have really zero love for him. We never say that, but reality, or for our neighbors. And we just go and we wonder why no one's walking through the door out of darkness and into light. We wonder why things aren't happening. Why chains aren't falling away. But here's the thing. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Okay? That person that we cannot humanly love, we can love with God. See, God first loved us. He loved us when we were unrepentant sinners, wretches, enemies of him, Idolaters, blasphemers, sinners. How unlovable were you and I? Look at the cross. Because everything Jesus suffered on that cross is what we deserve. That's what we deserve. In God's justice, that's what we deserve. How much does God love us? That before we ever gave our first word of thanks to him, he did that to himself for us. He showed us what it looks like. 
And that same heart of love that sent him to the cross for us, sent him to the cross for that person in our life that we can't seem to find a way to love. But he loves him. And the Holy Spirit in us loves him. So if we can start to let God love them through us, we can do it. He shows us the way and he makes it possible. Remember what I said last week? And this is really exciting. And the combined, I think it is, Three verses, I believe, in here. Maybe it's, it's two. But God works in us to will and to do His good pleasure. Is it His good pleasure to love that person? Absolutely. So He works in us to put that desire in us and to bring it to pass. And He has given us, through Christ, all things pertaining to life and godliness as loving them Part of godliness? Yes. Well, he said he's given us everything we need. And he's made us partakers of his divine nature. Does his divine nature love them? Yes. Well, you and I in Christ are partakers of that divine nature. So we have God's divine nature. We have all things pertaining to life and godliness. And we have God himself at work in us to help us want to love him and then to help us love him. We can do it. And that doesn't mean we run and throw our arms around them. It doesn't mean we say what they did is okay. It doesn't mean we don't keep healthy boundaries if that is required. It doesn't. But we can love. Just as he loved. Just as he hung above the soldiers gambling for his clothes at his feet as his blood dripped to the ground. And said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they did. He is at work in us to will and to do his good pleasure, and we can do this. And when we do, his love is then perfected in us. I'm going to start for a couple minutes a look at this, and we'll probably finish, well, return to it next week. But if you look at 1 John, 1 John is an amazing book to sit and read about what we're talking about. Okay? In, in 1 John, the number of times that God talks about loving others because we've been loved. Um, he talks about love being perfected in us, God's love, when we love others. You just sit down sometime and, and read through, or if you're not a strong reader, put on the audio Bible and listen through 1 John. And this is not the Gospel of John, it's 1 John. And he begins... Uh, well, the first part I'm going to read is 1 John 2, 1 to 11. My little children, I am writing these things to you so you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. He loves them all. By this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But then verse 5. Oh, you already brought it up. Okay. Um, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may be sure we are in him. Please just keep that up there if you could. Um, so by this, by whoever keeps his, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may be sure we are in him. Now this is, I believe, our love for God. Our love for God is supposed to express itself in obedience to God. As we keep his word, our love for God is perfected. I love you, God, and now the fulfillment, the completion of that is I now go out, I love others, and I honor God with my life. I obey him. And then he goes on and continues talking about this commandment to love others, and he goes further down, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. In him there is no cause for stumbling, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Then I go ahead to 1 John chapter 4, and he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever, sorry, verse 7, I'm sorry, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. 
In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, was made present, tangible among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And verse 12, have that one, please. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Our love for him is perfected. What is perfected? Brought to completion, brought to fullness, lacking nothing, right? Full, filled. Our love for him is perfected, brought to completion, wholeness, fullness, when we then honor him with our choices, our life, our actions, our love. His love for us is perfected in us when we love one another. So his love for us, just like our love for him is not to end, meant to end with, the end is not just I love you, it is I love you and now my life will express that by how I choose to honor you. Okay? You know, just think of any relationship you're in. Someone says, I love you, I love you, I love you, but they continually hurt you, offend you, disobey you, do whatever. It's like, okay. His love for us, that's not the end either. It is meant to then carry forth in us now loving others. That's the fulfillment, the perfection, the completion, the lacking nothing. You so love me that I now go love you. That is the completion of that. That is the perfection. And if you start to look for this theme, we start to see it. Then skipping farther ahead, John says, We come to know and believe the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And I'm going to end in this place. If we fear the end, if we fear that day when we stand before God, then we are not perfected in his love. We do not fully understand how greatly he loves us. If we fear standing before him, we do not fully, completely understand his great love for us. But think about it. And here, here's the thought. Why, why would we want to obey God? I can think of two reasons. We love him or we fear him. One or the other. I want to obey him because I love him. And that's what love does. Or I want to obey him because I'm afraid to get hit with lightning bolts and cast into hell when I stand before him. You know, one or the other. Those are the two reasons I can think of. If I do it from my love for him, then the more I love him, the more I'm going to want to do what he asks, which includes loving my neighbor as myself, loving my enemy. Do you see why it's important to focus on loving God first with intentionality? Why other things start to take care of themselves when we do? Now, if I fear him in judgment, but his love is perfect and casts out fear, then the more time I spend focusing on his love for me and my love for him, the more that fear side is going to disappear because I realize his punishment was poured out on Jesus on the cross. He might correct me as a loving father to bring me back on course, but he's not punishing me. His punishment and wrath was satisfied upon his son on the cross. It's done. It is finished. So it strikes me, if I look at two, I mean, I want to obey him, right? One way or the other. It strikes me with two options in my life, I'd much prefer to obey him, be out of love for him than fear. You know, how much better to walk through life 
just crazy in love with God and overwhelmed with his love for us and so much that the world's pull fades away and we just want to do what God wants us to do than to walk through life afraid of this angry God with blue lightning bolts who sits on clouds. Those are really the two options, Christians. You know? And so how much better to just spend our energy on loving him and focusing on his love for us. He loves us perfectly, people. We don't need to get him to love us. We just need to discover the love he already has for us. He's never going to love you any more than he already does. There is nothing you can do to cause him to love you any less. His love for you is perfect. He sees you in the righteousness, Christian, of his son. He has forgiven everything you have ever done, and he beckons you to walk into a new life and a new hope and a new purpose and a new strength today, right now. His love for you is perfect. You do not need to make him love you more, try and get him to love you more, hope he will love you more. Because I'll tell you now, it's impossible. They say there's nothing that's impossible with God. That is impossible. He will not love you any more than he already loves you. You just need to discover that love. You just need to spend time. And what I want to talk about next week, I'd hope to today, but I won't, is in my experience, love for God only comes with intentionality. Now we might have that moment when someone shares the gospel or someone does this powerful preaching or there's that song and we get overwhelmed with this emotion and love for God for a moment. But a consistent love for God that is with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind above our love for anything or anyone else in this world requires intentionality. It requires us to focus on Him, to focus on His great love for us as we love because He first loved us. To focus on His great love for us. Look through the New Testament sometime and if you don't want to do it this week, I will have verses God will be next week for you. Um, but how many places we are called to love, show grace, show forgiveness to others because of the love, grace, and forgiveness we have been shown. Focus on his great love for you. Focus on all the reasons he has shown you his love, all the ways, all the things you have done that he shouldn't love you, but he still does. Focus on his purity. Focus on his holiness. Worship his majesty. Worship his grand. It takes intentionality, people. Be still and know that I am God. Do not be afraid to take that phone and put it on silent mode or put it face down or turn it out of the room or turn off the computer for an hour and just read the song. Because that little phone, whether it's emails or texts or social media posts, just sits there and whispers, check me, check me. What if you miss something? What if someone's trying to reach you? What if, come, come. Okay? Anyone else get into those places where every five minutes you're checking to see if there's a new notification or a text or an email? I find the harder I'm trying to work on focusing on God, the more I feel like I better check my email. Why? I'm not that important. Really? If someone really has an emergency, we got a landline, and you know, it's, or you know what? If I just needed that time with God, then someone else will be raised up to meet that person's needs. Jesus, do you know how many ministry moments he walked away from to repeatedly show us going alone to the top of the mountain to just be with the Father? It wasn't that everyone at the base of the mountain was miraculously healed before he left. He just said, this God got to come first. I will talk more about this, God willing, next week, but I, I, I want to tell you this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. It is the greatest commandment upon which all others start to happen, under which 
Ephesians, we're talking about this with the youth group, rooted and grounded in his love. Think about that. If a tree is rooted and grounded, it is anchored to something. And those roots provide two purposes. The life flows through them to the tree that then bears fruit, but the roots also keep the tree strong in the storm and the wind. It goes both ways. It gives the tree life and it keeps it steady and strong. Rooted and grounded in love, may we grow in Ephesians 4, 19, do whatever. Um, anyway, somewhere in there. Um, we grow into the fullness of God, it says. Love Him, but it will only happen with intention. Now, you are going to have to set aside time and be on the mountain with God. And I say that figuratively, it could be in a valley too. Father, thank you for your love for us and showing us what that looks like. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for these patient folks here that let me chase rabbit trails and go longer than I probably should, but that's all right. We can watch a three-hour sporting event or a two-hour movie. We can certainly give you the first of our time. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to anoint these words and just grow them in our heart. Let us live hope and joy, knowing that greater are you who is in us than he who is in this world. And there is nothing you've called us to do or be that you've not given us the strength and you will not work with us to do or be. Thank you. Please bless us through this week with divine appointments. Protect us against the attacks of the enemy, spiritual, physical, mental, emotional. Reveal lies in our hearts we believe and strengthen us to go out as your army kick the devil in the tail. I thank you and ask this in Jesus' name.